Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Emmy nominee and Golden Globe winner for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Rachel Bloom. And Emmy nominated writer for Inside Amy Schumer, Tammy Sager. Hello. Check. Hi. Yeah. Tammy and I both just came from our writer's room, so this is our writer's room sheet. Yeah, we were like, we are very dressed up, and then we went backstage, and we were like, we are not. Oh, we, we look like shit. Up. But like, we show up in the writer's room, and everyone's like, ooh, who's meeting the queen? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Rachel. Um, hi. Hi. When I first saw you perform, it was um, in the writer's room of How I Met Your Mother, where I work with your now husband. Um, Neil Patrick Harris, no, uh, <laughs> uh, Dan Greger. And we were watching your video, which was well approaching a million views at that point, very quickly. It was for your song, Fuck Me, Ray Bradbury. Right. If you have not seen this, Google this. And it was, I mean, it was one of those things where, it was, <laughs> as, of, as, a, as a lady comedy gal, I was like, where the fuck did she come from? And I wanted to know, like, because of this sort of, this overview of mentor is how did you, you starred, you wrote, you sang, it's a great video. And you were a baby and you did it yourself. Yeah, um, so first of all, I have to say, I know I'm here to talk about performing mentors, but I, so my, my husband is right there, um, he's, uh, a little older than I am, and so when he got um, hired to write on How I Met Your Mother, which was his first major TV writing gig, I was a singing waiter on a boat that went around Manhattan for tourists. That's what I was doing, so I found out that he got How I Met Your Mother um, while I was on the boat. What was the first song you sang? Uh, I'm so that? excited <laughs> by the Pointer Sisters. Did you really sing yeah, that song? Yeah, I did, and, and, I just, and I started crying. I mean, this is like a side note, and I went up to it's very hard to be um, like an aspiring actor in New York City. Everyone's kind of desperate and always thinking about themselves. And I'll never forget the first person I came up to to tell that he got hired to write for How I Met Your Mother. I mean, I was crying. I went up to this guy, David, who was a, a, a fellow singing waiter, and I went, my boyfriend just got hired for How I Met Your Mother. And David goes, that's so funny, because Josh Radner, who's on the show, is from my hometown, but I don't think he'd remember me. <laughs> <laughs> and I went... Hey, David, my boyfriend just got hired for How I Met Your Mother, and David goes, oh my god, can you write me a part? LOL, congratulations to him. Like, no one fundamentally cares about other people. Um, uh, <laughs> and then I had to get back to work, and I think I probably got under-tipped, as I did all the time there. And then you moved to LA, where everybody is super supportive. Yeah, where everyone's super... <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but, but the point was, so I was still working as a singing waiter on a boat, and I think this is even before I re released Fuck Me, Ray Bradbury, I went and visited How I Met Your Mother for the first time. It was my first time on a TV set. It was so cool. And I said hello to my best friend, Neil Patrick Harris. And, um, no, I'm kidding. Um, and the thing that struck me was every writer on staff was so nice that you'd all watched my video, or no, this was after Fuck Me, Ray Bradbury, that you'd all started watching my video in the writer's room. And the fact that you were all supportive and I was still a waiter, and so you, this guy Chuck Tatham, who's another writer on How I Met Your Mother, came up to me, and I was 20, I mean, 22, I was a singing waiter on a boat, and everyone said, how's your singing waiter gig going? Oh, by the way, nice music video. And, and uh, Pamela Fryman, who's the director of almost every episode of How I Met Your Mother, who's a genius, applaud for her. Yes, yes. you can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, every time I visited set, Pam would ask me, how are you doing, how are the music videos going? And when I'm talking about mentorship, that was my first example of a television uh, set and, and a TV writer's room, and you all were the nicest people, and I really took that to heart. And it was such a great example of you do not have to be mean or inclusive or snarky to be a good writer, to be funny, because I then got hired for my first TV writing job while he was still writing for Him at Your Mother, and I was the only girl, and I was the youngest on the staff of all guys, and bless their hearts, some of them were not nice. And I remember having a long talk with you at a Christmas party yeah, about it. Yeah, it wasn't great. I would cry every other day. Um, and it was so nice to come to a set where that basically wasn't tolerated. And so that really set a standard of you don't have to be mean 
to be funny. And I think that extends to my performing mentors. And when I think about performing mentors, I also think about my teachers. And the teachers that I had were people who both, the people, the teachers that I had who influenced me were both challenged me, but also very kind. Was this at NYU or in high school? Kind of both. I mean, every great teacher, and when I think about, it, when I think about specifically what teachers I'm talking about, I think about NYU, any outside film and TV audition classes, and then of course the Upright Citizens Brigade, which we're mainly talking about right now. Um, well, maybe let's, yeah. let's actually talk about this. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so I, I guess for folks yeah. who don't know, that's um, an improv theater. It was founded in New York, um, and they they have an out. That's not how you say it. They have a branch in L.A. <laughs> uh, and it's class improv classes and shows seven nights a week, and we both did stuff there. Well, and you were already a superstar there because you are. This is why I wanted to talk. Yeah, about exactly. This. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you are you were already a superstar from Chicago, which if you're a student, it just means I'm old. No, <laughs> but if you have to understand, like if you are an Improv 101 student in New York, and someone is already doing all of the pro shows at UCB, and then let alone comes from Chicago, that's a huge deal. And so, what I the reason I wanted you to moderate this is I wanted to talk about specifically the women at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater as my mentors because. The, the inspiration for it was, I remember when Bridesmaids came out, and I was writing on that TV staff with all men, and there were all these articles of, okay, this is gonna prove whether or not women are funny. There were all these articles about women funny, women funny. And I just remember thinking, I already know women are funny, not for myself, but from seeing all of the women go up every night at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. And I'm, just, I'm, not, just, I'm not just talking about you, or Ellie Kemper, or Rebecca Drysdale, or any of the superstars there. I'm talking about just any given night on Herald Night, Mod Night, which is the, the sketch team night. It's just, I had already seen not only women being fearless badasses, but also women writing and performing their own material. And so the question of whether or not women were funny to me was old news. I didn't understand why we were talking about it. Yeah. And so you were, so go, to go back to your initial question is where did this girl come from, and how is she doing this all herself? I had examples in everyone who was around me. My roommate uh, out of college was Alana Glazer from Broad City. Isn't I was that ridiculous. Yeah, they were paired together in college. Yeah, we were just we were we knew each other from our improv 301 class, and we decided to be roommates. She started doing Broad City while we were living together, but that's just what I wasn't like. You can write your own web series. It yeah, that's what everyone was kind of doing, everyone was, not to say Alana's not amazing, she's amazing, but it's the same thing with me. I had examples of women all around me writing and performing their own material because the material was not out there for them in auditions or mainstream media or whatever. I think the thing that was so um, fascinating for me about you and also about your show, about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, is like I definitely have examples of like Elaine May was she is the queen. If anybody who's interested in comedy, listen to old Nichols and May uh, albums. You can find them on iTunes. They're phenomenal. And she is, she is also ended up, she wrote movies and directed, but she, queen of improvisation. But I'd never seen somebody do what you were doing with this like ridiculous musical theater background that is, in my mind, the most earnest, corniest thing in the world. <laughs> and yet you were able to explore something dark inside of it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we, we had the examples of Im women doing sketch and improv, but not this musical theater, musical bend on it. Like what made you feel like you could? Yeah, well, I was a musical theater major at NYU in a fairly rigid program. It's not a program at NYU anymore, but it was called CAP 21. And my schedule for two and a half years of college was three times a week, I would go to studio 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. I would do three hours of dance, lunch, and then I would do two hours of acting, two hours of voice and speech. So it was very, very, very rigorous. And so I really studied musical theater. We had to write essays about Rodgers and Hammerstein. We did an entire Rodgers and Hammerstein unit. And so I was given a, a quite an extensive knowledge of musical Theater, and there was a time, musical theater was my passion, that studying it so extensively kind of made me um, want to push it away for many reasons. I felt like I didn't necessarily fit in. The program was kind of rigid, and I felt like I didn't maybe fit in. And also, at the time, I had gotten on a college sketch comedy group, this group called Hammercats, 
and I felt so in love with sketch comedy, and I fell in love with the freedom of it because my whole life I'd said to myself, you have to be on Broadway, and I hadn't said to myself, you have to be a sketch comedy writer. So for the first time when I did sketch comedy, I was trying my best without fear of failure because there were no emotional stakes. But with musical theater, I had told myself, if you're not the best, you're nothing, right? Your talent is synonymous with your self-esteem. And so it took me a while to combine that freeing feeling that I had with learning sketch yeah. with my original love of musical theater. And I tried to figure out how to combine the two. And I remember asking people and they couldn't really tell me. I took a musical theater writing class at NYU. They kind of told me how to do it, but it was really just combining the things that I loved. And then I transferred at NYU from, from musical theater to experimental theater. And that's when you're really, I mean, you are doing, you know, somersaults on mats and crying and, you know, exposing your tits and, and then getting really into like the grittiness of, of, I mean, not to sound like highfalutin, but the grittiness of human nature in kind of an experimental, almost unformed way. And then so taking those kind of raw emotions that I'd learned in experimental theater and then translating them to both comedy and musical theater, it was kind of figuring out my own voice, but I had the template of watching people do it at UCB. Not with the same musical comedy voice, yeah. but people craft shows. And I have to say, this is weird, but one of my mentors is frankly my husband who's sitting right there. Um, I feel like we failed the Bechdel test from <laughs> the beginning of this, where I'm like, I knew about you from your boyfriend. I know, I know. Husband. But, but, but it really is. It's part of a community. It is. And I think that the thing, the reason I'm citing my husband is we were driving cross country. I was trying to develop a sketch show for UCB. I played him a musical comedy song that I had written to be part of the sketch show. And he said, oh my God, this is so unique. You should just do that for the entire sketch show. And I had seen him write and perform his own material at UCB. And so it was just kind of looking at people who led with example. And so I, so the musical comedy aspect of what I do, yeah, was me finding my voice, but I had such a precedent with watching people older and more experienced make their own work and film the things that they wrote. And so when I made Fuck Me Ray Bradbury, I had seen other friends do sketches. There was this sketch group called Landline TV that was made up of all people who are my age. And they were using this um, amazing cinematographer, this guy Paul Rondeau, who's still a working cinematographer in New York, who was this one man band of, I mean, you paid him like 400 bucks for a day and he brought all of his equipment, all of this amazing lighting, and for the first time, sketch comedy started to look beautiful. And so when I made Fuck Me Ray Bradbury in, in 2010, we were just coming out of the kind of trend set by the landlord, the, fun, the first Funny or Die sketch in 2008 right. for things With to kind of look. With Adam McKay and, his, uh, and Will, Ferrell. Will Ferrell and the little two-year-old yeah. girl. Yeah, and so, and so some of the charm of that was it looking very homemade, and Friends of mine had just started to make things look really professional, and I thought, oh, well, I can make a very professional looking I can make video. like a Britney Spears level video. And I have to say, I'd written the song, and the Britney Spears idea, not to fail the Bechdel test, was my husband's. He right. was like, you should do a Britney Spears. <laughs> and let's call that the male gaze, but it fucking worked. <laughs> it was a great idea. Well, uh, Two, two thoughts I just wanted to get to. One is, too, with Shannon O'Neill, where you were talking about, like, having an example. Like, I remember yes. seeing her one-person show at UCB, which was, like, it was, like, a talent show put on by female inmates at, like, the Charlie Sheen. Oh, Mexican my God. I, you're prison. totally right. And it was so fucking fearless and weird. Like, Shannon, like, the, to me, the examples of, like, those women at UCB was... No fear of failure. No, and there was no no, and no fear of not looking ladylike, like or not. No, I agree. So Shannon O'Neill, who is the current artistic director of the UCB Theater in New York, was my Improv 101 teacher. So already from the get go in Broad City, she's um, what's her the name's bro, uh, is her brother uh, Abby's roommate's brother. Uh, I want to say Gemberling, but I can't remember his character's name. Oh, Bev Bevers, Bevers' yeah, yeah. sister, with the weird toe on her side. <laughs> That's Shannon. So she was my Improv 101 teacher, and so from the beginning at UCB, contrasted with my college sketch group, which was very male-heavy, um, I right away was trained by a woman who both was balls-out funny, but also very supportive, and not 
mean and knew how to give us constructive notes without being like, fuck off, that wasn't funny. And I'll never forget when I started at UCB, the big, the big person at UCB was Rebecca Drysdale, who's another, who's a friend of both of ours, who's another one of my favorite performers. And so already- The writer for Key and Peele for the whole season. Oh, she's on the uh, current season of Arrested. She's been on every, I mean, she's amazing and should be, I mean, every, there are so many people at UCB, not just women, but people who just, I don't understand why they're not A-list celebrities. Um, but just already from the beginning, seeing examples of women who didn't give a fuck. And I remember doing an improv practice group, and one of our coaches, this woman, Megan Nuringer, who's another um, improviser at UCB, said, it was me and my friend Becky, we were doing a two-woman improv practice group, and she said, you know the fat fucks at the theater? And I knew exactly what she was talking about. She was talking about these, these big guys who kind of just didn't give a fuck, like these basically like guys who seem like Chris Farley, who, who are wonderful and talented in their own rights, but they just, they walk into a room and they command a presence and they don't give a fuck. She said, be like those guys. What if you walked into a scene and thought you couldn't fail? And I think that women in general, I don't know if it's, whatever it is, it's society telling us that we have to walk into a room and apologize for who we are. I had learned to kind of be meek and defer to the men in my life and not want to step on any toes or be a bitch. And slowly I learned from watching women at UCB, oh, I don't have to worry about that. What if I walked in and was just myself and ballsy in the way that I saw men be ballsy? Well, we, we, we got the signal to wrap it up, so I will. But I just, I want to say like this, especially this last season of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I feel like it took such a beautiful, dark turn also in your performance and that that is also something that we don't see in comedic song. Yeah, let's, I feel like somebody Thank you. Was, and it was really cool and brave and exciting to watch. And um, I just want to thank you. And Tammy, I want to say thank you too. And, and we're talking about mentors. You are one I of my can't. mentors. I've been no. watching you. I've been, but I have been watching Tammy perform at UCB for um, 10 years. And the fact that you knew my work and were so nice to me when, I, when he started How I Met Your Mother meant so, so much to me. And you, when I think about the idea that you don't have to be mean to be successful in comedy or funny, that you can be supportive and warm and also be a fucking amazing joke writer, you are like the prime example of so, that. So this is my lesson. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, that, that, that's my lesson to actually to people here is be nice because yeah. they will end up fucking running their own shows. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to uh, mentor many people throughout the years. For me, I find it incredibly important for us to not keep our knowledge and our experience to ourselves. Taking your story, which all of our stories are unique, but you can find something in each story that you connect to. And it's just, even if it's just a feeling you get from giving, because you'll get more than you'll ever give. That's just the way it is. You help someone, you see that light go into them, that, that energy alone could fuel you for a whole year. Through the Academy, um, I've been able to sit with the Fred Rogers Foundation and several people that have won the awards there. I've been able to be a mentor to learning how to get through that maze in Hollywood. It's it's this great place that has all these rules, but none of them are written down. And so it's always a pleasure to be able to say, look, you got to know this, this, and this going into any of these situations and, and helping them avoid all the traps that I definitely walked into most of uh, as I came up. And it's a joy to see these people really flower and, and turn into great professionals. It's important to give out and be helpful and I, I, I take pride in all the PAs that I've worked with. Whenever I see them on a future project, they always come running up to me, I'm an AD now, look! And they're just happy to see me and like, you've taught me so much. It's really, it warms my heart when I see, see them now. They're like, they're doing huge projects now on their own and I'm like thinking, God, maybe I had something to do with that. It's, it's nice to, to know you had a positive effect on someone's life.